Yes, welcome back to Home Studio Q&A for yet another week here on Studio Live today. This is our weekly live show where I answer your questions about mobile recording, home recording, gear, all sorts of things related to creating, recording and releasing your best music in the home or mobile studio. My name is Pete and this is Studio Live today. If you want more information about the channel, if you want to catch up on all the tutorials, know when I'm going live, all of those good things, head on over to studiolivetoday.com and you'll be able to find all of that information. Alrighty, we will be diving in to the, the main section pretty soon, but uh, which is all your questions. But I like to do a bit of a feature topic, and this week I thought I would touch briefly on USB audio. So what is the deal with USB audio? If you're using home studio gear, you're probably using something that uses a USB connection. Now, USB has gone over a lot of different iterations. Started with USB 1, then it went to USB 2, then USB 3. I know, I'm sounding like the count from Sesame Street. And now it is USB-C. So we've actually gone and every time we upgrade USB, it gets a little bit faster. But overall, it is still the universal serial bus. Now, it was invented to create a universal high-speed connection, sending data and power between different devices. So if you want to break it down simply, it is basically just a way to make sure that if you've got an audio interface, a microphone, a MIDI keyboard, a mouse, a typing keyboard, a webcam, whatever it is, if you need to send a lot of data from one thing to another thing, you'll need USB. Now here in the home studio, there's a few things to keep in mind with USB. USB can send data and power, as I mentioned before. But the thing is, you need to make sure that especially if you've got some devices that are using lots of power, you need to make sure you have enough power to power those devices. So there's some things to keep in mind here. Some of your USB devices like a mixer or a larger audio interface will plug into AC power. They'll plug into the wall, that will power them up, and then the USB cable is only sending data. That is sort of the best case scenario because you don't have to worry about power at all. And regardless of whether you're plugging into a Mac, a PC, an iPhone, or an iPad using your lightning to USB adapter, we'll talk about in a moment, then you're going to have enough power. But probably... The number one question I get about USB devices is when people plug them in, they power on, they look like they're working, then they'll get halfway through a face-melting guitar solo and their USB interface will cut out, their USB microphone will cut out, they'll get a message like, uh, not enough power to run this device, this device uses too much power, this device is not compatible and has stopped working. That is usually caused by power. And the way around that is to use a powered USB hub. And I have lists of all of this different gear over at studiolivetoday.com slash gear. So if you do want to find out about USB audio interfaces, microphones, USB powered hubs, the USB lightning to USB 3 adapter cable from Apple you need for your iPhone or iPad, you can head over to studiolivetoday.com slash gear. Because if you're using gear that doesn't plug into the wall, it will use the power from your device. Now, if you're using a desktop computer with like a big 500 watt power supply, you'll be golden, you'll be good to go. However, if you're using a smaller laptop, especially like some of the sort of sub notebooks that we have now with the SSD drives and tiny little power supplies, it may overload. So even your laptop might not have enough power for a big USB audio interface, something like the Steinberg UR22C that I use, you may need additional power. So you may need to use a powered USB hub. The same thing with your iPhone or iPad. I recommend a powered USB hub for a couple of reasons. Number one is that it will make sure it powers up your devices. And number two is that you can connect multiple devices. So the nature of a lightning connection and a USB to lightning adapter means that you can only put one thing in at a time. But what if you want to have a USB flash drive, a MIDI keyboard, a audio interface, and a mouse and keyboard all connected to your iPad at once? Well, get yourself a four port USB powered hub and you're good to go. And in fact, the 10 DAC model that I recommend also has a power only port so you can actually power up. You can plug into the lightning port on your adapter and power up your iPad at the same time. So that's just a bit of information about USB. It is not super difficult, but if you're running into trouble and you need some troubleshooting help, it's often down to the compatibility and the power. So think USB power. The compatibility side is making sure that the USB device will work. So if you're on Mac or a PC, make sure you've got the latest up-to-date drivers. If it uses drivers, 
If you're using iPhone or iPad, make sure it's a class compliant device. That is one that is compatible with iOS that doesn't require drivers to run. So there you go. Everything you wanted to know about USB and USB power. And hopefully this will help because as I said, one of the questions I get most often from folks is, why is my USB device not working? And probably seven to eight times out of 10, it's to do with power in some way. Let's dive in now and start talking questions here on the show. If you do have a question, as Jade has mentioned here, please pop question in front of it and I will circle back and answer any of the questions that you have throughout the show. But for now, let us jump up and take a look at some questions I've had through the week. So here's a question that has come through Instagram. This one's from Laura Zovi Base. Uh, Laura Sophie Base, maybe. <laughs> uh, wanted to ask you a question. I follow the video to connect an interface to an iPad, but all I record, I can only hear it from my right headphone. Now, I wanted to throw this one up here because this is something I get often. If you are using a two-channel audio interface to record your gear, to record your sounds, here's the deal. So I'm holding up here. If, you, if you're on the podcast, the audio version, you won't see this, but I'm holding up my Steinberg UR22C, a two-channel audio interface, and you can see it's got a, a, a channel here, which is mic or guitar, and a second channel, which is also mic or guitar. Now, the thing with this is, if you plug this straight in, it will be recognized as a stereo input by a lot of your different apps, and by default, it'll record channel one to the left and channel two to the right. Now, how do you fix this? Well, in an interface like this, it actually has a mono button. So that's super handy. That will push the same audio to both channels. And that means that you can get your microphone directly into both channels. If you're shooting a video or something with your iPhone, that's a great solution. If you don't have a mono setup, you'll need to fix it in editing. So the way to do that is to bring it into, I use LumaFusion on my uh, on my piece, uh, on my iPhone or iPad or whatever or video editing software you're using. You can also convert the audio part. If you're just doing audio, throw it into something like Audio Share. use Audacity if you're on the PC or the Mac and actually just change that. So it'll just be sitting there on the one channel. You either need to convert it to mono or copy it and paste it to your other channel, to your right channel, and then you'll be golden. You'll be good to go. So hopefully that helps you out, uh, Laura. And anyone else having that problem, it's a common one because you think, hey, I just want to record this microphone. Why is it all suddenly on the left? And why is my guitar on the right? That's why. It's because it's basically the way that a two-channel interface works is it just uses stereo. It's just left and right. It just separates those out. So hopefully that helps you out. Let's continue on. We've got another question here uh, from, this one's from Abraham Cruzado. It said, bro, hope you are safe and doing well. I have an iPhone 8 Plus Scarlet 2i2 second gen and use the USB hub to power the interface, but I don't get audio going through. The gain meters don't work, but the phantom power works. Any suggestions? Now, this is probably related to the thing I talked about at the start with USB. The problem with USB is that if you plug something in, it will power up, the light will come on. But there's two things that may be at play here. Number one is the audio interface is not class compliant and therefore it's not sending the signal. I happen to know that the Scarlett 2i2 second gen, because I have one and I've used it, is class compliant. So if you are using a powered USB hub or you're using the USB power as part of your lightning to USB 3 uh, adapter, then that will be working. That will work fine. The problem may be if you don't have the genuine Apple lightning to USB 3 adapter, it often won't work. It'll look like it's working. It'll deceive you by looking like it should be operational and then it simply won't. So if you are using a non-standard Apple one and you're having this problem, you may need to check these out. I know they are more expensive. These are about $39 US. Again, you can go to studiolivetoday.com slash gear to check them out. But, and they're about $20 or $15 to buy the third party sort of aftermarket ones, but these will just work. I've had this same one since I did the first video on it about two or three years ago, and it is a brick. It is uh, solid. It works. You plug it in, it works every time. So I know I've, I know for the folks who are here regularly, I've ranted on this a lot before, uh, and it may not be the problem, but again, eight or nine times out of 10, it is that problem. It's either not class compliant or the USB powered hub or the lightning to USB adapter is not compatible. It's not sending the right signal through. So hopefully that helps you out. Uh, we've got another question. This is from Dave Plays Bass. 
Maybe it's Davey 504 in disguise. Uh, if you have a moment, I saw your video, how to connect an audio interface to an iPad. My concern is I want to send music from GarageBand, the sequencer, to a mixer. My iPad is an iPad Pro 2018 USB-C. What would you suggest? Thanks in advance. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. The absolute simplest way, now I don't have an iPad with a USB-C connection, but I do have my handy dandy iPad Pro first gen here. If you have an iPad that has a headphone jack, guess what? That's a stereo output. All you need to do is grab a three and a half mil to two TRS or to two RCA, whatever your mixer accepts in their stereo channels, and then you send the output from the headphone into there. If you've got a USB-C port and no headphone jack on the newer iPads, you'll need to get the USB-C to three and a half mil adapter. That's the easiest way. That way you'll get a TRS connection, a stereo three and a half mil connection that will come straight out and can go into your mixer. Now that's an analog connection. The other way, of course, you can go is to get yourself a USB audio interface. So something like the Steinberg UR22C has the ability to send TRS outputs directly, which you can send to monitor speakers, but you can also send those into TRS inputs and get a balanced stereo signal digitally coming out of any iPhone or iPad and send that out to your mixer to mix in with your other sounds, which is exactly what I do when I'm doing tutorials and other videos here. I'll either use the three and a half mil jack and have a connection there, or if I want to actually be in inputting things at the same time, I'll just output the, uh, the either the headphone jack or the two TRS connections directly into my mixer. So hopefully that helps out with that question. We'll jump through a couple more here from YouTube and then I'll check the folks here live and see if we have any questions from folks here. So jumping over to YouTube, Hendrix Korokoro, what a cool name. Uh, so this is in relation to sharing GarageBand. So, and this is a common question and I wanted to throw it up here because I get this question a lot. It's why does mine have no select? in the top right. So here's the deal. When you are exporting from GarageBand, and this is pretty specific to those in GarageBand on your iPhone or iPad, but other apps on your other devices will be similar. There's two locations. So there's one that is browse and there's one that's recent. So if you are in GarageBand and you're trying to do something and you're in the recent tab, you often won't have the same options. You can open your recent documents, you can edit them, you can save them, but you can't do things like export. You also need to make sure that you're in GarageBand and not the Files app. They look almost identical, but they have very different functionality and features. So if you wanna do something to the file, like copy it, compress it, paste it, move it, duplicate it, be in the Files app, if you want to export the audio, export the project file, do any of these sort of things, be in GarageBand, but make sure at the bottom, it doesn't say recent, it says browse, go to the location, you have your select button, you'll be good to go. I hope that helps you, Hendrix, and anyone else having that same problem. Uh, we've got a long question here from Nick, but it's an important one. So something I'm still unclear on, and this is related to DistroKid. So if you use a music distribution service like DistroKid, then uh, you have the option to update to a musician account or a musician plus account or a label account. Now here's how it breaks down. I'll ask the question and then I'll explain it. So if you have the musician plus account and you share it with one other person, how can you have the revenue of one song sent directly to them? In Teams, you can only add those who do not have a profile already. And since we both have the same, I cannot divide. How does the re revenue splitting work? So here's how it breaks down. If you have one DistroKid account, if it's a label account, or if it's a Musician Plus account, you can release to a whole bunch of different names. So Musician Plus account, you've got two different artist names, but the assumption is they are both still you or you are managing those. The actual revenue splitting that you can do assumes that you have two separate artists with two separate DistroKid accounts. And it works the same with a lot of other places. So say you've got the DistroKid label account, it will separate out. You'll be able to go into your settings and see how many streams you're getting and how much money you're making with each artist's name. However, there isn't a quick and simple and easy way to, to divide that because it's assuming that you're managing that as the label manager or as the artist that has just those two different names. That's different to if you've got two different accounts and you want to actually split revenue and share it, you can actually go in and do that, but you need to nominate the other account and then send that over. So I know it's a, a wee bit confusing, but hopefully that makes sense. If you've got one DistroKid account, you get one revenue stream coming in, you can choose to share that out to other DistroKid accounts, but you can't actually split out 
across the multiple artists. Unless you can, and if you can, somebody let me know down in the comments or the chat because uh, I've I've only got the Musician Plus account and I've I'm me and I've just got my two artist names, so everything comes back to me. Anyway, a quicker question, and this is to do with iRig interfaces. So I did a video about the the sort of the well, not the iRig, but the cheap sort of. Um, the iRig clones that you get, which are like a three and a half mil connection. And then you can plug your guitar in. So there's a guitar jack input and there's a headphone output. The question here from Redwood is, would this iRig interface work with a MacBook 2? So here's the thing. It will work with any device that has a TRRS jack. Now I have a whole video where I explain the difference between TS, TRS and TRRS, but here's the very quick basic version of that. TRRS stands for tip, ring, ring, sleeve. And what that does is it's got four poles, often called a four pole connector. It has a ground, it then has stereo output, and it has mono input. So this is why when you plug something into the three and a half mil jack, not that my phone has one, but it has the dongle, a three and a half mil jack on a smartphone is a TRRS jack so that it can send stereo output to your headphones at the same time as sending mono microphone input into the smartphone. And that's why your headsets that you get, just your normal wired headsets, have those four pole connectors on there. So that's the same connection that an iRig or an iRig-like device will use, TRRS. If your MacBook or your PC laptop has a single headphone jack, it is very likely that it is a TRRS port. And assuming that it uses the same standard configuration, which is tip ring ring sleeve, which has stereo output and mono input, then it probably will work. Now I said all of those sort of maybes and things because Basically, every manufacturer does it slightly differently. Some may only have a headphone jack and just assume that your input, you're going to use USB. It doesn't have any microphone input at all. Others will have a, a combo jack, meaning that it is TRRS and you can actually do input as well. So that's what it all comes down to. Hopefully that makes more sense. Uh, let's go. Uh, yeah. And Metallion says something here says, I wish people would be more specific when they mention iRig. They have so many different interfaces. I never know which one they're talking about. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's why I like to try and clarify that they're, yeah. When, when people talk iRig, they used to, or they usually mean ones that plug in via the headphone jack. Of course, iRig now make digital interfaces, which plug in via lightning, via USB. There's a bunch of different things which we can delve into in the future, I'm sure. One more question here, and then we will check in with the folks here live. This one's from Arnob Gabriel. Is there a way to make a choir sound like singing church style, males and female and children? And this was a, uh, on my mixing vocals video. So uh, obviously, yes, the, the short version is if you have males and females and children, you simply layer up tracks. You get them to record, you get you record, and then you get a female to record, and then you get a child to record, and you basically do uh, a slow version of gang vocals where you're recording one track at a time, and eventually you'll have 12 tracks, and it will sound like a choir. The, the couple of key things to, if you're doing that method is to vary the mic position. If everyone's singing right into the mic, it will be too full on. Like a standard choir, you might have one person that sings here, one that's here, one that's here, one that's here, and one that's back here. So if you vary up the distance and the positioning against the microphone, you'll get a more realistic choir sound. It's not going to be stereo, but it can be once you start panning it out. So you might want to well, when you're doing the one over here, pan that to the right so it makes it feel more like a stereo sound. And the one over here, pan it to the left. If what you're talking about is can you just create that artificially, a couple of ways. You can sing and use a vocal transformer type plugin, so a pitch shifting and formant transforming plugin that's going to change the pitch of your voice. And I've got a video if you search uh, Pete John's, uh, I think it's called, what is it called? Vocal Transformer, the one in GarageBand, but there's other plugins that do the same thing. You can try something like that as well. Or of course, you can use a synth instrument to add those. So if you, depending if you want words or if you just want the ha, 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 ha that sort of harmony and make it sound like a choir, you can use some of the synth sounds that are choral voices. So if you want a collection of cho choristers, I struggle with that word. Uh, my daughter's in a choir, and every time they mention choristers, I'm just like, are you saying cloisters? Those things at the university where you sit and have your lunch? or No, choristers. Anyway, we'll continue on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we'll have a quick sip of coffee, and then we'll dive on over and see if we have any questions 
from the folks that are here live. Uh, we have a bunch of people here. We've got Luigi80. Thanks for the info. Thanks for you. Uh, I Symphonic has a lot of choir, choir patches, says Gino. Uh, <laughs> week, week, nudge budget. Yes, it is expensive, uh, and I do need to cover that soon. So that's a an app for your iPhone or iPad, and that does have some good choral sounds. And Jade Star, in fact, has also mentioned the same thing there. Let's scroll on up and say good day to other people. We've got Tim Osborne watching here live. Joined for a bit here in the UK. It's probably very late for you. Well, I know it is very late for you, Tim. So I appreciate you dropping in. Uh, hello to Kartanaga Calls. Hello. Hi to you. Um, Greg, yeah, Greg Hernandez says, Ben Folds having uh, feet, having technical difficulties. He's also an Aussie, checking in here. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm actually competing. I didn't mean to. Like, the, the last few weeks, Ben's been going on at 9.30 my time, and I've been starting at 8.30. This week, he's pushed it an hour earlier, so he's overlapping. But it sounds like he's having technical difficulties. So there you go. Hopefully, that means that I can start watching straight after this show, and so can you. So yes, he is, he's in Sydney at the moment. He's over there with his wife in a like apartment because, uh, yeah, he's, he's basically stuck here because there's no travel in or out of Australia if it's not essential. And I think he decided a few weeks back, since he's been in Australia quite a bit, he was touring here at the time. He's uh, setting up shop and he's doing a weekly live stream as well. So there you go. Uh, Heart of Darkness said, uh, I got the Satachi iPad dongle with three and a half mil audio USB-C. Yeah, USB-C is so cool because you don't need the specific Apple stuff. So once all the iPads and iPhones move to USB-C, which will happen sometime in the future, our US Lightning to USB 3 dongle will become redundant. We'll all be able to use whatever hub or docking station or dongles you want, and that will be super cool. But for now, yeah, not so much. Uh, and Pyro Steve agrees that it is. It's the most important piece of gear you can own. And I, I know I rant about this a lot, but you're right. Here's the thing. People have come to me and they own, I mean, it's not so much these days because the, the, the biggest iPhones, uh, iPads now have USB-C. But people have come and said, oh, I've got the new iPhone 11 Pro Max and I got a, a $5 USB to Lightning dongle off eBay and it won't work. And my response to that is you've spent $1,100 on a, phone and then you've spent five dollars on the dongle like i know it's 39 dollars for a piece of plastic i get it it feels wrong but again if you're going to produce music and you want a reliable connection for your you know 500 hundred dollar interface to your thousand dollar phone spending 39 bucks to make sure that the connection is stable doesn't seem like a lot to me that's just me everyone may have their own uh, their own views uh luigi hello from liverpool in the uh, in the uk uh, i'm doing a i'm doing a 60s live stream today and there might be a couple of songs from a band from liverpool just a, just a side note there <laughs> hello to Blake Yanok. I hope you are doing well, my friend. Uh, lots of people saying hello, but we're low on questions here today. So uh, I'll keep scrolling up to see if we have any. We do have a question here. A uh, question from Heart of Darkness. Has anyone found a portable USB-C audio interface for iPad Pro? Ideally, two channels and MIDI. Thanks so much. Uh, not specifically USB-C. You would need to use a USB A to C adapter, but the iPad, uh, sorry, the iPad, the iRig Pro IO Duo is actually a bit of a powerhouse. So I use a, I use the uh, single channel version. So there's a, a single channel and a duo version, and I've reviewed it here on the channel. Again, if you go to the gear guide, studiolivetoday.com slash gear, uh, or just search Pete John's iRig Pro, you'll find my reviews of that one. And that has a two combo jack. So you've got two channels in, it's got MIDI in um, as well, using a, a, an adapter there. It plugs in via USB directly or lightning. So you can use it with your lightning devices or just the, use the USB and convert that to USB. I don't think anyone's made a USB-C specific portable interface yet, but uh, the, the iRig Pro IO, really nice. I mean, it's made of plastic, so it's, you know, it's not super sort of durable. If you want something like that, I'd go the Steinberg UR22C, but obviously then you need to worry about power and adapters and all that sort of thing. If you want something that's just going to be plug and play for on the go, the iRig Pro IO uh, fits the bill. Scrolling back up, I don't think we have any other questions. If I have missed your question, I apologize and please uh, circle back around. Oh, we do have another question from the Pyro Steve. Have you seen the Sensel Morph MIDI controller? No. <laughs> so it's 
probably something super cool. Should I check it out? Let me know. I don't, I don't know anything about it. I haven't seen it. Uh, I, I try to keep my finger on the pulse, but sometimes my finger's somewhere else because there is so much to keep up with. Like, I know, I don't want to, I don't want to start whinging because I know first world problems, but don't you hate how much cool tech there is that you have to keep up with? I know, right? Um, but yes. Uh, so no, I don't, but let me know if it's something that I should check out. Uh, okay, we're going to continue on here. Uh, oh, quick quick note here from Bubba. Hello to you, Bubba. Great supporter of the channel here. I've been working with WavePad app today. So far, I'm happy with how it handles pitch changes of samples, rhythm and time, space, next. Any experience? Yes, I've been playing around myself with WavePad. So I've been playing around with a few different things. Uh, I played around with the, the Lexus Audio Editor. That didn't have any sort of speed and pitch change stuff that worked particularly well. I then played with WavePad. I'm using the free version. It let me do a couple of conversions, which sounded pretty good. And then it said, this is a paid feature. You need to pay for this sucker. So I'm thinking I may pay for this sucker because it does look like a, a pretty much an all-in-one kind of audio editing. And a lot of people are coming to me at the moment saying, Pete, how do, you, how do you change loops? How do you change the pitch of loops? How do you change the speed of loops independently without it sounding terrible? And GarageBand can't do it. Some other apps can do it. Uh, Jade has mentioned EG Pulse, which can do it in, in some ways. Uh, but just having a simple thing where you go, open this file, uh, change it. It's now 100% of its speed. Make it 120% of its speed. Save it. And th then you can go from like a 100 to a 120 BPM loop. I know that's something that a lot of folks are looking for. So hopefully, uh, yeah, I, I will keep playing around with that. And Bubba says, yeah, bought the full suite. Let me know your experience, Bubba. Uh, shoot me an email. Uh, I trust your judgment. So if you say, buy this, Pete, it works. I will buy it, Pete, it works. And then we'll review it here on the channel. And when I say that, uh, that means I'll review it at some stage. I know, I know Pyro Steve's waiting on, a, on my eDrums review. Uh, folks are waiting on the iSymphonic review. Yeah, we, we will get to it. <laughs> uh, we've got a question from Jeff Brush, not Jeff Bush, different, Jeff Brush. Uh, I'm wondering what equipment would be best for me if I want to do some kar home karaoke. Love it. Uh, but also would like to do some recording on iPad as an as in interface or mixer. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it, it's how long is a piece of string because it really depends on uh, how much you want to spend and what sort of quality you're looking for. The absolute easiest, quickest, most convenient way is to get something like an iRig Pro that I talked about before because that's plug and play. You plug your microphone in, you plug it into your lightning port and you're away. You can record your vocals, you can use it for karaoke over the top of other tracks, etc. You can use a mixer. Uh, the cheaper Behringer, um, Behringer series, the Q series mixers are a little USB mixer if you just want the stereo audio out, they work quite well. Even the cheaper Behringer interfaces like the UM2, that works quite well as well. You want to step up a notch, go to something like the Focusrite Scarlett or the Steinberg UR series. They're my recommendations for uh, next level audio interfaces for the consumer. Uh, and then you go into sort of your hybrid mixes. So like the Zoom Livetrack L8 that I use and uh, some of your more higher end mixes that can do a, a bunch and have the bells and whistles. So yeah, there's, there's a bunch of options. Um, try it out. You can even get to just start out with something like the iRig Pre, which is just a microphone preamp for for your iPhone or iPad uh, that plugs straight in, or even the iRig microphone, which is like a, a USB microphone, but specifically for your, um, your, yeah, your iPhone or iPad, or go the USB microphone route. I know that was a lot of stuff. I know people ask me a simple question, then I give them seven options. I think sometimes people just want me to say, do this. So <laughs> Jeff, if you've got, if you want to give me all of your specific scenarios, and then I can give you one recommendation straight uh, directly for you, uh, shoot me an email, pete at studiolivetoday.com, and uh, I'll try and help you out. Um, a quick one here from Barry Smith, and then we'll answer the last few that I have on the list here. And that is, uh, when iOS 14 come out, do you think it would be a whole lot different from iOS 13? That's a very good question. Uh, I believe so. I've heard rumors that it is going to be a whole lot different. It's, I, I don't know, like there's different sources saying different things about whether it will come out with the iPhone 12 or whether it will release before that. History tells us that it'll come out with the iPhone 12 sort of late in the year, but with everything going on in the world, um, nothing is certain right now. So who knows really? But it's uh, Apple are unlikely with the current lineup of products there's nothing that's really missing and there's no killer feature that would make you go, I need to get iOS 14 over 13 that I can think of. So uh, they've already done the iOS 13.4 with the trackpad and the mouse and the keyboard and that sort of update, which I'm 
still on the fence with. Haven't quite got used to the new mousing. It's not, it's not as intuitive as the old mousing. That's just my view. Anyway. Um, but thank you. Thank you for your question and for your comment there. Let us uh, jump over and make sure... <clears throat> we have a few more questions here. How are we going on time? Yep, we're, we're right towards the end here. So a couple more questions and then we'll finish up the show. So question here from Obaki-san says, how to mix in GarageBand iOS. That's the video. Is there a metering plugin that you can use? Now, the reason I wanted to throw this out here is that I don't know. I don't use a lot of metering plugins, I must admit. I'm kind of just used to knowing around about where <laughs> where my mix needs to land in GarageBand that's then going to translate over to something like Final Touch for mastering, and then I use the Final Touch metering to make sure it's all good. Um, so no, I don't know of anything. I know people have asked about LUFS metering, LUFS and RMS and all the different things. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've never gone down that rabbit hole. Like it's it's probably something I should know more about. Um, but I think, I think as you know by now, I, I, I kind of learn as I go. I know what I need to know and what I need to do to get good mixes. And some people would be saying, Pete, that's blasphemous. You need to know about exactly all the different metering. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, I don't. And uh, if anyone else has any advice for good metering plugins for iOS that you can use with GarageBand or use with your iPhone or iPad, then please let me know and I will uh, I will check them out or I'll at least have them to be able to recommend to others. There you go. I just realized you could see my icon behind there on the screen. Uh, let's continue on. Question here from Yuav Clear. Is there a way to change the tempo of these files? Now, We've probably covered this a little bit. We've talked, we were talking with Bubba before about WavePad and EG Pulse and other apps that you can use. Short answer to this is you can't change the tempo or pitch of a loop or audio file in GarageBand unless it is a genuine Apple loop. If you bring in your own loop as an AIF or a WAV file, it's not going to pitch, shift, or time stretch to match your tempo. If it's a 120 BPM loop, it will remain a 120 BPM loop unless you edit it outside of GarageBand, make it 100 BPM, and then bring it back in and re-import that new file. That's the short version. There's probably other things that you can do, which is why it's so good to have the Studio Live Today community here. Because if you have answers to this question, or if you have suggestions, please drop those in the chat, in the comments. Help out a, a fellow member of the community here. <clears throat> Continuing on, uh, using an amp simulator on a touch base was the uh, was the video here. And Zobo Trombi, I thought that said robot zombie, but it's Zobo Trombi. Uh, loving your vids. Do you have any idea if it's possible to recreate a slap bass using MIDI? Hmm. No. <laughs> so again, this is another one I wanted to throw out to the community because I know that many of you create a lot of cool sounds and manipulate your sounds and find ways to get good sounds in GarageBand and with other apps and plugins. The only close to slap bass that I've found in GarageBand is there's a couple of loops. So if you search slap under the Apple loops, you'll get a couple of loops. There's a couple of alchemy synth patches that sound a bit plucky and slappy that you can kind of tweak some of the bass sounds. And then the upright bass has a, not so much a slap, but an upright bass sound. But you can sort of substitute that in. You can layer that in and get a bit of that slappy sound if you want that. But in, in terms of like a real, you know, Flea from Chili Peppers style electric slap bass, short of grabbing a bass guitar and plugging it in and playing it, yeah, not so much. In fact, that would be a really cool, I'm, I'm working on like guitar loops and, and things at the moment. I did a video recently about making your own loops and importing them into GarageBand. Yeah, any good bassists that want to record some slap bass loops to share with the rest of us, I think that would be super cool. I would love to have some funk slap bass to throw on my GarageBand tracks. Or is that just me? Who knows? Let's move on here. Uh, we've got one from Mongzi. says, I just got my iPad 7th generation. Have all the updates done. Was just wondering, is it new enough? I'm trying to download iMovie and I have to do it all again and again. So there's a bit of an issue here with apps like iMovie and GarageBand, and that is that they're compatible with iOS 13, but sometimes if you've updated from iOS 12 to iOS 13 and you don't have them properly installed, it gets all confused because the problem is the new versions of the apps are only compatible with iOS 13. It'll sit there trying to update the iOS 12 version to iOS 13 version, and it seems to keep failing. The solution for this, like most things, 
is to completely delete it and reinstall it. So if you've got an icon, same for any of your apps, is a good tip for these apps. You've got an icon there that's sort of grayed out or it keeps spinning and looking like it's updating and then failing and not working, the best thing to do is to tap and hold it, completely delete it, go to your app store or go into your account, find where you've downloaded it, tap to download again, it'll freshly add it and freshly download and install it. You won't lose any of your settings or any of your files, especially if you've got them saved to iCloud Drive and backed up, which I always recommend. Got another couple of emails this week from people who've lost a bunch of stuff from their iPhone or iPad. Back up, people. Like, if you do nothing else today, I don't care if you don't create another piece of music today, back up your stuff. Put it somewhere. Zip it up and put it on Google Drive. Put it on a USB flash drive. Make sure it's backed up to iCloud Drive. Don't care where you back it up. Back it up, please. Because I don't want you to be the next person that emails me next week and says, my phone just crashed and now I've lost everything. It's like, no, if your phone crashes, you should lose that phone and you should be able to either fix it or replace it with a new phone. You should never lose the data. Data is replicatable and therefore it is replaceable because if you've got a backup, you'll be able to bring it straight on back. Anyway, I don't know when that became a lecture. I was answering a question and then I started lecturing. Uh, let's see how many questions we got left. Or oh, we're going to have too many to go through. Let's pick a couple here. Uh, and we'll go with these and then we'll finish up. So uh, how to convert MIDI tracks to audio tracks in GarageBand was the video. And I got this question, which is, can you merge audio tracks into a MIDI track? Now, the short answer is no. And I thought I would explain this one because I do get these questions a lot. The, the way that music works, electronic music, is there's basically two ways of capturing music. One is through data. So that's usually called MIDI or virtual instruments. So that's the, in GarageBand, that's the yellow tracks and the blue tracks, sorry, yellow tracks and green tracks, where all it is is the note information. The actual audio isn't stored in those tracks. The audio is whatever virtual instrument you're pointing that audio to. So if it's a drum kit, it's pointing to drum samples. If it's a synth, it is pointing to the original synth instrument. And all that's being stored is the ones and zeros. The this is a C note for this amount of time. This is a D note for this amount of time at this velocity. Audio, however, is the actual audio waveform. It's the actual audio data, the, sorry, the actual audio sound, again stored as digital data, but it's actually audio. So the reason this is important is that when you're talking about editing things, when it's MIDI, you can just grab that stuff, you can move it around, you can change it really easily because all you're changing is the data that's pointing to the sound. When you've got an audio track, you can't change the actual sound because it is the sound. So that limits your ability to do things like quantizing, which means lining it up on the grid. It limits your ability to move things around without a whole lot of effort of cutting and pasting and tweaking and moving. And it limits your ability to do things like this, which is merge audio over to MIDI. Now there's a couple of exceptions. There are some apps such as MIDI Guitar 2 is one of them. There's another couple of apps that I've forgotten the name of that allow you to do things like play guitar or sing, and then it captures and converts that into digital ones and zeros and MIDI notes, and then you can put those into your MIDI tracks. That's pretty rare though, and what you're capturing there is not actually the audio, you're just capturing the note and the note length and the velocity, and it's converting that into a MIDI track. So hopefully that makes some sense. I know it's, uh, for, for those that have been doing this for a while, you're like, yeah, Pete, like that's pretty obvious. But when you start out, it's not that obvious. The difference between MIDI and audio, it, they're both digital recordings, right? They're both digital ones and zeros in your DAW. So it can be confusing when you're first starting out. Uh, let's uh, go one more here. So this is from Silvia Carventes. It says, I have iOS 13. Now this is to do with the mouse and keyboard support in iOS 13. And we're probably going to go full circle here because this is probably going to be answered by what I talked about at the very start. So I have iOS 13, but when the mouse pops up on screen, it says that it is not compatible with this iPhone and it worked for two minutes. Then it says it's not compatible. Please help me. Here's probably the problem is that if, again, like I know, I'm a broken record, but if you're not using this one, if you're not using the genuine Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter, that is a very common trait. So if I grab, I'm not going to be able to do a full demo here, and once again, if you're listening on the audio version, you're not really going to be able to get much value out of this anyway. But let's just grab, so here is my dongle for my USB mouse and keyboard, and I would plug this in to my Lightning to USB 3 adapter, 
If I plug this directly now into my iPhone or iPad, that is going to work out of the box because it's all battery powered on the keyboard end. It's going to work fine. It's going to have enough power and it's going to be compatible because it's all class compliant. If I do the same thing to a third party device and try and plug that in, it's going to do one of two things. It will, well, three things in fact. It will simply do nothing. So it will not even power up. It will not connect. It will not do a single thing. That's sort of one. Number two is that it will power up, look like it's working and not work. Number three, in fact, there's probably four things. Number three, it will power up, start working and then cut off after a certain period of time. And number four, if you're super duper lucky, it may work and continue to work in perpetuity. The last scenario is pretty rare. I don't come across too many of them. Usually it's annoyingly scenario three, which is it looks like it's going to work. It seems to work for a little while and it only cuts out at the most inopportune moment. And this is why I recommend getting the genuine adapter because the last thing you want, bad enough that your mouse and keyboard knocks out, but what if your microphone or your audio interface or your mini keyboard, what if they stop working? Really annoying, you don't want that. This device uses too much power or this device is not compatible and it's not referring to your device generally. So that's the, the thing to keep in mind. It's usually not that the MIDI keyboard or that the mouse or that the microphone is not compatible. It's usually talking about this, the actual adapter, the thing between the two. That's what it's saying is not compatible. So I hope that uh, helps you out and I hope that helps other people out. Uh, Luigi80 here says, uh, yes, just bought a 12 pound adapter, which didn't work. Definitely just worth buying official Apple. I know. And I, a lot of people will accuse me and say, yeah, you're an Apple fanboy. You're trying to like pimp their products. I'm like, no, like I don't, I could probably sell, if I just sold people the fact that you could buy the cheaper one, I'd probably send them to an affiliate link. And because they're 12 pounds instead of the 30 pounds or $20 instead of $50, I'd probably get people to buy like 10 times as many. No, the reason that I say buy this one and pay the bit extra is that it works and I've tested them. If you want, if you want proof, hang on, if you want proof. I've tried them, right? I've tried these. <laughs> they work a little bit sometimes. Like I've, I've, I've been down the rabbit hole of trying the cheap eBay ones. And in fact, I just tried an experiment. I went on to every, I'm, I'm having a bit of fun, a bit of time on my hands. Uh, but no, I went on to Amazon, in fact, and every single non-Apple adapter, I put a question on there saying, does this support iOS 13? Can you connect devices such as microphones and audio interfaces? Not one single person came back and said yes or even gave me a reasonable answer. So do it at your own risk. Um, make sure that you uh, know what you're getting into. Uh, what is it? Caveat emptor, buyer beware, you get what you pay for, all those other things. Anyway, clearly I'm ranting, so we are at the end of the show. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who's been here live on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you for dropping in and spending uh, a little bit of time talking about audio and home recording here. If you have follow-up questions or questions I didn't get to in the show, drop those down in the comments below. And while you're there, if you did enjoy this, if you got some value, hit the like button. That just tells me I should come back again for episode 25 again next week. Once again, jump over to studiolivetoday.com to find out all the ways you can follow what I'm doing. All the tutorials are there. It's all free. You can jump in there and just check out everything that you want to. The gear guide is there as well if you want to pick up some gear. Thanks again, folks. Until next time, I'll see you on the next episode of Home Studio Q&A.